What's up, my friends? Welcome to Challenging Conversation. I am your host, Jason Menes. And today, we're going to be talking about the existential threat that Iran has to the rest of the world. My friends, this is important because as we're seeing this war unfold between Ukraine and Russia, we're also going to be seeing down the line the threat that Russia will have at some point. They already do, but that, that threat is going to continue to grow against Israel. Well, who's Russia going to rely on to help invade Israel, to help conquer other regions around them? One of them, a big player in all of this, will be Iran. So I want to talk about that and have some challenging conversations regarding the, the expansion that Iran is having, not only in their nuclear capability, but also their alliances with Russia and other terrorist-linked organizations. And this is something that Iran has been doing for quite some time. And this is something that we need to pay closer attention to as Christians. And I know sometimes it's uncomfortable to talk about terrorist cell groups, sleeper cells, and you know, go back and, 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 and relive some of the horrific events that unfolded before 9-11 and even the day of 9-11. And post 9-11 into the Iraq war, etc. These are things that some churches talk about. Some of you listening or watching don't mind talking about. You actually want to talk about it more and try to make sense of, yes, where is Russia mentioned, if any, in Scripture? Where is Iran mentioned, if in fact they are? What is happening right now as we speak, and what will take place in the future? Robert Spencer wrote a great book that I highly recommend called The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS. He writes in his book, quote, The Islamic State, a.k.a. ISIS, is the wealthiest, the most successful, and most dangerous terror group in the world and the most mysterious. One jihad terror group has outdone them all by actually establishing that Islamic State and embarking upon a reign of terror unmatched in recent memory, rivaling the atrocities of Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, the Islamic State is nothing less than the foremost evil force of our time, end quote. Why is that significant? Because what Robert Spencer is linking to, what he's talking about, is actually Iran. You see, the thing about Iran is that they're not looking to impress the world. They're not looking to gain nuclear capability, nuclear power, for political reasons. No, it goes much deeper than that, my friends. They are an Islamic state that is seeking to fulfill prophecy. So when we do mention ISIS, you have to look at ISIS in the scope of Iran. Ever since they became the Islamic Republic of Iran, when, when the Ayatollah took over and they changed the name from Persia to Iran in 1935, yeah, they had some alliances with America. They had some alliances with Israel, but that's long gone, my friends. They've had their wars with Iraq, and they continue to have their eschatological and even Quranic battles religiously with the Sunnis. Iran is mainly made up of Shiite individuals. The, this is significant because if you go back in, in, in the history of that region, this goes back, you guys, to even uh, Father Abraham, right? When you go back to Abram from the land of the Chaldeans, this is the region. This is when you go back even after that in, in the 538 BCE, you have people like Cyrus, uh, who allowed the Jewish people to go back and to rebuild when they're in captivity. Xerxes, uh, Alexander the Great came and he conquered many of this region. This is when you had the Ottoman Empire. When you had most of that part of the world was controlled by Muslims. And so right now when you're seeing this battle between Sunnis and Shiites, they're actually coming together under this fold of ISIS. Now, one of the fundamental differences between them, I would say, in an ideological um, perspective, 
is that the Shiite people that are based primarily, right, populated in Iran, they believe that Muhammad's son-in-law and his cousin, Ali Abin Abi Talib, he is actually the true successor to the Mahdi, the Imam Mahdi, which is the Islamic savior, would be the equivalent of Christians believing in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. That's the true bloodline. And they oppose Sunnis who don't believe that Ali Abin Abi Talib is the true successor. So that is a huge um, divide between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And this is significant, my friends, because this is what they're advancing. And a lot of us think it's about oil, it's about geopolitical issues, it's about trade. No, it runs much deeper. My friend, Dr. Mark, Mark Hitchcock, had this to say when he was referencing Iran. He says they're driven by an apocalyptic, genocidal ideology that's fueled by their view that the end of days is at hand. So when you put things like that in perspective and understand, again, we don't have to be experts in all this, but I do believe that when Christians become more informed about these things regarding the Middle East and its effects on Israel, and I, in my two previous podcasts, and so if you've missed that, wherever you get your podcasts, I encourage you guys to take a listen. But one of the first things that I addressed in kind of this little mini-series is Russia mentioned in Bible prophecy, when will this coming Russian Islamic invasion take place? Which, again, let me just say, I don't know. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of brilliant minds, a lot smarter than me, tend to think that it's before the rapture, leading up, right before the rapture, right after the rapture, mid part of the rapture, uh, or excuse me, tribulation. I don't know. Okay, I, I tend to lean based on what I see contextually, and this is all speculative, that it happens maybe at some point before the rapture of the church. And again, I could be wrong, but what we are seeing right now, you guys, we are seeing clear signs. These are birth pains, the scripture refers to. These are birth pains. We are seeing clear signs of, of, of Russia and Iran and a lot of these Muslim groups who are banding together to strategically go against Israel at some point. This has been brewing for some time, but it's building to a point, you guys, where we have to watch this because it has major eschatological implications. And this will definitely impact us, not just on an economic level, but this will really impact us just like 9-11 impacted us greatly. Not just the loss of lives that people have suffered and still missed to this day, but what it did to our economy, what it did to our national security. I mean, it changed the way we not only traveled, but the way that we did life, essentially. If Iran continues to increase their control in the Middle East and works with Russia to bully and to negotiate deals to push their nuclear capabilities, that is not going to be good for any one of us. Matter of fact, the Philos Project, they researched and looked into Iran. As I stated earlier, they remember, they are the state sponsor of terrorism. They're the leading state sponsor of terrorism, the largest one. So put that in perspective. So you and I should not be shocked when it comes to the level of persecution that comes out of this region. They lead the charge. They lead the charge in an unrelenting strategy to eliminate, guess who? That's right, Christians in the Middle East. Now, another side note, this puts things in perspective, okay? Iranian people, they deny the Holocaust. They don't believe it ever happened. Now, I believe that the people within the Ayatollah, they know that it happened, and they've learned about what the Nazis did to the Jews so they can use that as a blueprint so they can persecute not only the Jews, but Christians as well. And that's what we're seeing. Matter of fact, I referred to you in this um, article that I'm going to pull up right now. And in this article, uh, Razi, he's an expert. He says in distinguishing between Iran here, when it comes to persecution of Christians, it's a pursuing of, or he refers to as a strategy 
of eliminationism, an organized, unrelenting, Nazi-like campaign to reduce the Christian presence in the Middle East. Eliminationism means shrinking the Christian communities by making life for them unbearable, including through confiscation of private property, arbitrary detention, torture, public incitement, abduction, and killing, explained Razi, who spent seven months researching this subject, and he's going to be releasing a report in the coming weeks. Razi provided an overview of the decline of Christian population in the country. So, for example, in Iraq before 2003, the Christian population stood at 1.5 million. It is currently between 141 to maybe 171 thousand or 0.3 percent of the population my friends that is a drastic drop over a million people over 90 plus percent of the people over 90 plus percent left the country that were once there in 2003 so razi noted that the most the most of the christians were pushed out by the shiite militias ah who did i mention earlier that comes from iran Iran are Shiites. This militia that is being advanced by Iran, we are seeing take effect. Remember, who finances Hezbollah? Who founded it in 1982 in Lebanon? The Iranians. So these Shiite militias, you guys, are the ones that are persecuting the Christians. The article also mentions here in Syria before 2011, the Christian population was 2.3 million. It's now 677,000. Before uh, the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, was forced to rely on Iranian help during the, the, the um, Syrian civil war, he left his Christian minorities alone. Razi said it was the Iranians acting as military advisors to the Syrian army who introduced the eliminationist strategy into Syria. In some cases, the Iranians in the Lebanese Hezbollah wore the uniform of the Assad regime army to hide their identity, but the local people understood that they were from Hezbollah and Iranians by their accent. Razi noted that in Yemen, where the Iranian-supported Shiite Houthis have taken over large swaths of the country, the Christian population has dropped from 40,000 to 3,000. In Lebanon, where the Iranian-supported Hezbollah dominate, the Christian population has been reduced from 54% to 30% of the total population. You guys, this is significant. We are seeing a rise of persecution, and it's, been, it's being led by the Iranians. So yes, as we are praying for this, this war, as I'm recording this, to end between Russia and Ukraine, we have to also pray for the protection of Israel, as we've talked about here on the podcast. And we have to be t keeping our eyes also on Iran of what they're going to be doing. Because here's the thing. We've been hearing for quite some time that Iran wants to have nuclear warfare. They want to be a nuclear power. Now, they've always voiced that their advances to develop nuclear weapons is not to harm other people. They said that they're not going to be sending them to Israel or different parts of the world. They're not going to be used to threaten the world to get what they want. They say, the Iranians say, that it's entirely for the purposes of advancing peace. Okay. This is what we have to ask ourselves. How can a nation who currently does not have nuclear capability be, be a safer place with the nuclear capability when they are already the largest state sponsor in the world for terrorism. terrorism. How can we trust people who finance and support Hezbollah and Hamas and ISIS? How can we support a nation, my friends, who is on this, again, this Islamic ideological positioning that they have to destroy the world in order for the Mahdi to come and to rule and to reign. There's another article that I want to refer to you by the, the Wall Street Journal. 
And they say that over the past 12 months, Iran has taken major steps to advance its nuclear program. So as I'm recording this, as you and I are talking about this, and we're considering the threat, the existential threat that is that Iran has to the rest of the world, they're developing their capabilities, you guys, to have nuclear warfare, uh, nuclear weapons. And for the first time, the Wall Street Journal reports, Iran has produced 60% enriched uranium, a short step for making weapons-grade nuclear fuel. In March, in a confidential report, so this was in 2022, a report circulated to members. The UN Atomic Agency reported that as of February 9th, Iran had 33.2 kilograms of 60% enriched material, the most highly enriched uranium ever recorded for Iran. Some of that material has now been turned into metal plates. Iran has continued its work to master more advanced centrifuges, which produce nuclear fuel faster, potentially allowing it to slash its so-called breakout time. It also started producing uranium metal in January, which is a material used in the core of a nuclear weapon. On December 1st, the UN Atomic Agency reported that Iran was, for the first time, using advanced machines to produce 20% enriched uranium in its heavily fortified Fordu nuclear facility. Iran has also severely restricted the access of UN atomic energy inspectors to sites related to its nuclear program. Although they still have regular access to Iran's two uranium enrichment facilities, Iran has also started producing parts for advancing centrifuges at Karij, a location from which UN atomic agency cameras were removed in June after what Tehran said was Israeli sabotage of the planet. So what we do know, my friends, is that Iran is on track of developing nuclear weapons. And the question we got to ask ourselves is, what would that look like for the rest of the world? And if they continue to align and support Russia's attempt to gain more authority and power in advancing, right, the big bear here, advancing the Roman Empire, and they start aligning with the interests with the Kremlin, and the Kremlin with Iran, as we're kind of seeing right now, Remember, because some of their interests align, not entirely. I mean, Russia doesn't support Iran's eschatological position of the Mahdi. They're a communist uh, nation. They're not a religious one. Most of, of, of Russia that we know are either atheist or non-theistic. Okay? Now, they claim there's a Russian Orthodox uh, religion, but it's a small percentage. And just as we talked about with Iran persecuting Christians— we also see that Russia has, you know, ad advanced in their attempts to do the same, to silence Christians in Russia. I want to show you a video of a friend of mine, Eric Stackelback, who I'm actually going to be having come on the program, um, hopefully, I think, in, within the next few weeks. He travels regularly to Israel, and he has studied Islam in the Jewish state, for decades, and he is a just a brilliant thinker, and he interviews a lot of the top people. And so I want to kind of bring him on and have a discussion about some of the things that we're talking about that. So look forward to that when it drops. But one of the things that Eric talks about in this video is this recent warfare that's taking place between Israel and Iran. So take a listen to what Eric has to say here. The White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan commented on this and said rightly that Iran is enabling these Houthi attacks against Saudi Arabia, equipping them, training them on how to use the drone technology, supplying them with the drones, uh, the drone components, ballistic missiles. The head of the snake, folks, is in Tehran in the form of the Iranian regime when it comes to the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, who we'll talk about in a minute the Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, Islamic Jihad as well in Gaza, the head of the snake, the epicenter for regional and really global terror is the Iranian regime. And it's very interesting to have Jake Sullivan admit as much, while at the same time, his colleagues in the Biden administration are negotiating a disastrous nuclear deal with the Iranian regime, which will unilaterally 
gift wrap the mullahs in Tehran with billions of dollars in sanctions relief, even as they're launching ballistic missiles, which, by the way, those 12 ballistic missiles, which I mentioned, came awfully close to the U.S. consulate uh, in Erbil. Now, the Iranian regime said they were targeting Israeli assets inside Iraq, but I can tell you those missiles came very close to U.S. assets inside that country, even as that is happening, even as Iran is plotting assassinations against former Trump administration officials, including former National Security Advisor John Bolton, and even as Iran is stirring up a hornet's nest throughout the region and sowing chaos wherever they go, the Biden administration, while acknowledging that openly, is still hell-bent on coming to some sort of agreement with the Iranian regime, which will, again, do nothing for the United States. I've asked that across multiple newscasts now. What exactly does the United States get from the Iran nuclear deal? Nothing. It is, when it comes to foreign policy, folks, I can't think of a worse decision. But other than 2015, the first incarnation of the Iran nuclear deal, which was courtesy of the Obama administration, Joe Biden was vice president, during that administration. Now he wants to revive this deal and fasten your seatbelts because this deal essentially only lasts for about two and a half years and it kicks the can down the road. And Israel is watching very closely. This deal makes war more and not less likely. Speaking of wars. So you hear from Eric, my friends, that Iran is in is is gaining steam as we know and they continue to attack israel and if you notice repeatedly in reports that come out when something happens with iran who do they blame they either blame israel or they blame america but i have to say this and this is so disturbing to think about it and it doesn't matter you know what your views are politically we have to understand that there have been many American leaders through various different administrations who have supported Iran, essentially. And in some cases, they say, okay, look, with your centrifuges and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll allow you to develop uh, these power plants so that way you can, you know, use it to power your, your country or to you know, provide power from other parts of the, in, within that region so that you can make money. But then they kick out inspectors because we know that they continue to try to advance have, you know, nuclear um, weaponry. And so they break the treaty on numerous occasions, and then we send them hundreds of millions of dollars in cash, which they have used not only to, to, to fuel their program to advance nuclear weaponry, but also to use it to advance terrorism. And so the sad reality is we, as Americans, even though we're trying to toe the line, even though we're trying to, to install peace around the world and keep people from you know, using this type of weaponry to destroy countries, essentially, and a lot of that's been good, but let's be honest, you guys, we are in a place right now where we are losing common sense, and we have turned our back essentially on Israel. And when I talked about in that previous podcast about fix your eyes on Israel, it is vitally important that we support God's chosen people because God will judge, and I believe some of the judgment that we've already experienced here in our country, in America, is a result because of how we've turned our back on Israel, how we've treated Israel. And so if if Iran gains more power through advancing their nuclear program. And they can use that as an intimidation factor to also fuel terrorism. That isn't good for anybody. So as Eric said, this is the worst case scenario. And we're even thinking of buying oil from Iran. What does that do? It gives them billions of dollars to, again, to use that to advance their ideology. So in a nutshell, when you look at this movement to fight the infidels worldwide and iran believes they're going to win in the end it first starts you guys with isis and from isis it's the caliphate it's this religious decree that they believe that allah has called them to do to lead to an armageddon 
a battle that will take place not just a not a not like World War One or World War Two, and potentially if we see a World War Three, but a global battle for the souls of mankind to convert them to Islam. And from ISIS, the Caliphate and Armageddon will usher in the the twelfth Imam, the Mahdi. That's what they believe. And that's why getting nuclear capabilities pushes them even closer to ushering in the reign of the guided one, the holy one, the Mahdi. Now, writing about Israel in the Middle East, a writer named Sinia uh, Sletvaya said that while Moscow uh, ratches up military and economic pressure on Ukraine and using forbidden types of weapons and indiscriminate firepower against civilians, many in Israel fear that Moscow's next move will happen in the Middle East where Moscow was formally aligned with Israel's worst enemies. And who's on top of that list? It's Iran. And what's significant, you guys, is what we're seeing unfold right now with Russia. We have to go back and, and look at Iran in 2010. Remember, one of the biggest pushes that many legislators were having within not only NATO, but in our own here, as I'm recording this in America, our own legislators, was removing Russia from SWIFT. So that way, there's no way that they can process people's payments, you know, working with international banking to fund their war. Pull them, you know, ban them from SWIFT, and that will be like the biggest nuclear sanction that we could possibly do. Well, guess who, who experienced that in 2010 was Iran. They were banned from SWIFT. And so it forced them to come to the world table and to negotiate. And again, to pull back from advancing nuclear capability, advancing terrorism, advancing, you know, their attacks against Israel. And that's when they negotiate what is known as the JCPOA. That's known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So as you had Iran banned from SWIFT in 2010, and now Russia primarily being removed in these heavy sanctions that have hit them, you know what this is doing, you guys? Again, it is causing Russia to become more dependent on Iran and Iran to become more dependent on Russia. Both countries have suffered by these world sanctions, these economic sanctions, and because they rely heavily, right, on selling and trading oil to fuel their economy. And now look at the hit that both of them have taken. So I believe. This only feeds what we see in Ezekiel 38 and 39 of this Russian Islamic invasion against Israel. And I talked about it in the past podcast about Fix Your Eyes on Israel. Israel has an abundance of resources, and Russia and Iran want it. Now, Iran, they want to just destroy and kill Israel. They want to destroy them off the map. Matter of fact, most of the people in that region that are uh, radical Muslims, if you look at the map, it's Palestine. They don't even have the word Israel there. They don't even recognize them as a people group. They're despicable. They don't believe that holy land is theirs. It's their, it, you know, meaning the Israelis. It is the Palestinians. It, it, it belongs to the Muslims. So this growing alliance, you guys, is significant that I think will feed into what we see prophetically at some point. Now, another thing that's interesting to, to point out is that Russia, actually, they, a few years ago, they put together what was known as the Eurasian Economic Treaty. And they were aligning with countries like Belarus, Armenia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Iran at the time, they wanted to buy into this treaty and work with Russia and these other countries. But guess what? Russia pushed them aside. Russia ignores them. Russia ignores Iran's demands. And now, which is so funny, right, how the tables have turned, as Russia is in a battle they thought would not last this long and have experienced major pushback and casualties. And economically, they're, they're not going to be able to come out of this for decades. And sadly, a lot of Russian people have lost their savings. They've lost their jobs. And many of them have lost their lives. 
and many families will never see their loved ones who went off to to invade Ukraine, thinking, a lot of them thinking that this was actually what Ukraine wanted and that they weren't going to be killing innocent women and children and bombing hotels and hospitals and, and department stores and malls, strip places. And yet this is what's happening. So Russia is in the thick of it, and they're being demoralized right now. So they're going to need Iran support more than ever. And this is why you guys bring in a third party, Syria is so vitally important because if Russia and Iran use that strategic location there with Syria to allow them to export their product and also to receive things to to help fuel their economy, not to mention that it's a strategic spot to attack Israel and any other threats that came from NATO. So this is why Iran and Russia need each other with their alliance with Syria. And again, this is all a prelude to the Russian Islamic invasion into Israel. If you look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, Persia is clearly mentioned there, which was ancient part of Iran, right? The name changed after 1935 and then 1979 as the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. So when you look at Russia to the, the, the north, according to this Gog and Magog prophecy by Ezekiel, you see Sudan to the south, you see Iran to the east, and you see Libya to the west. Now, I mention all this, you guys, to inform you to be aware of what is transpiring in our culture, not to scare you or to disturb you. But see, this is why these are challenging conversations, because it does make a lot of us feel very uncomfortable because it is a threat. And it disturbs us because a lot of us are comfortable and a lot of us appreciate the lives that we live. We're thankful for them and the religious freedoms that we have, especially here in America. I'm grateful. I know you are as well. But there are also people that are in the world who are experiencing heartache and pain and loss. And so I encourage you as we see things that are taking place with Iran, that we pray for the Iranian people. You know, when I was doing some research for this podcast, I was amazed to see how many ministries are devoted specifically to the country of Iran? And a lot of them I've never heard of. And so as I was, I was digging into them, I was blown away and thankful to God to see that God is raising up and has been using countless people. So even though, as I talked about earlier, with the decline of Christians in this region, guys, let us not be distraught over the fact that, yes, persecution has risen. We know that we're going to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, but we are to stand strong in our faith and to resist the attacks of the enemy. And, and you guys, you know what? Russian people, the Ukrainian people, the Iranian people, the Persian people, they need us. The Syrian people, they need us to pray for them. And if there's a, a way financially that you can support organizations and boots on the ground there, there are missionaries that are tied in for the underground church and, and to help advance the gospel, I pray that you would support whatever cause that you believe God is using to bring him glory and to bring hope and peace to the people who are in these war-stricken environments right now that need us to intercede on their behalf. So I share these things because we have hope in us. If you know Christ is your Lord and Savior, we are to look up and say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. And I believe at any time he can. But as we are expecting an imminent return of Christ, we are to face the opposition, the conflict, and the persecution without relent, w w relentlessly, without compromise. And so I pray that you be encouraged as you study these things, as you, as you hold fast to God's truth, that you would continue to faithfully execute the calling that God has given you guys. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch or to listen to this podcast. Your support means a lot to me. Make sure that you guys download the Edify app. You can go to edify.app to download it, and you'll get plenty of podcast shows just like this one. And we need your guys' support. So look for ways that you guys can support ministries like this that are constantly putting out the truth of Jesus to the rest of the the world. You can also go to standstrongministries.org. There you'll find articles and videos and books that I've written to help you stand strong in your faith.
So thank you guys for watching, for listening. Until next time, keep having those challenging conversations.